Unitarian minister Joseph Priestley is now barely a footnote in history. Priestley is glibly referred to as the discoverer of oxygen, but in his day, 
Priestley was one of the most profoundly influential writers of religion, politics, and science. His work influenced two revolutions on two continents. He laid the foundation for university curriculum and the science of chemistry. Priestley's friends included giants of the Industrial Revolution and the founding fathers of the United States of America. Meanwhile, he also founded Unitarianism as a separate sect in England and established the first Unitarian Church in North America. And in spite of, and because of all those reasons, he was also the most hated man in Britain. Joseph Priestley is perhaps the most famous person you've never heard of. Today's sermon was informed and inspired by the book The Invention of Air, A Story of Science, Faith, Revolution, and the Birth of America by Stephen Johnson. And this is the fourth in our series of illustrations of our Unitarian Universalist principles. Today, we honor our fourth principle to affirm and promote a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. So come, let us heed the lessons of this interesting life. Come, let it light our way. Come, let us celebrate together. Let this flame be to us a symbol of the wholeness we seek, its brightness dispelling gloom, lighting a path to faith and hope, its glow reminding us of the sacred bonds which link us to all people, its radiance calling us to seek justice, equity, and compassion for all the world. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humanity in harmony with the earth. Thus do we covenant together. Touch the earth, reach the sky. Walk on shores while spirits fly Over the ocean, over the land Our faith upwards is to understand Touch the earth, reach the sky Children as a sweet of joy In our lives the answer show Rosa Revere, Engineer by Andrew Beatty. Pictures by David Roberts. This is the story of Rosie Revere, who dreamed of becoming a great engineer. In Lila Greer's classroom at Blue River Creek, young Rosie sat shyly, not daring to speak. 
But when no one saw her, she peeked in the trash for treasures to add to her engineer's stash. And late, late at night, Rosie rolled up her sleeves and built in her hideaway under the eaves. Alone in her attic, the moon high above, dear Rosie made gadgets and gizmos she loved. And when she grew sleepy, she hid her machines far under the bed, where they'd never be seen. When Rosie was young, she had not been so shy. She worked with her hair swooping over one eye, and made fine inventions for uncles and aunts, a hot dog dispenser, and helium pants. The uncle she loved most was Zookeeper Fred. She made him a hat to keep snakes off his head, from parts of a fan and some cheddar cheese spray, which everybody knows keeps pythons away. And when it was finished, young Rosie was proud, but Fred slapped his knee and he chuckled out loud. He laughed till he wheezed and his eyes filled with tears, all to the horror of Rosie Revere, who stood there embarrassed, perplexed and dismayed. She looked at the cheese hat and then looked away. Oh, I love it, Fred hooted. Oh, I truly do. But Rosie Revere knew that could not be true. She stuck the cheese hat on the back of her shelf, and after that day, kept her dreams to herself. And that's how it went, until one autumn day, her oldest relation showed up for a stay. Her great-great-aunt Rose was a crew dynamo who'd worked on building airplanes a long time ago. She told Rosie of the things that she had done, and goals she had checked off her list one by one. She gave a sad smile as she looked at the sky. The only thrill left on my list is to fly. But the time never lingers as long as it seems. I'll chalk that one up to an old lady's dreams. That night, as Rosie lay wide-eyed in her bed, a daring idea crept into her head. Could she build a gizmo to help her aunt fly? She looked at the cheese hat and said, No, not I. My questions are tricky. Some hold on tight. And this one kept Rosie awake through the night. So when the dawn approached and red streaks lit the sky, young Rosie knew just how to make her aunt fly. She worked and she worked till the day was half gone, then hauled the cheese copter out onto the lawn to give her invention a test just to see the ridiculous flop it might turn out to be. Strapped into the cockpit, she flipped on the switch. The helio cheese copter sputtered and twitched. It floated a moment and whirled round and round, then froze for a heartbeat, and then crashed to the ground. Then Rosie heard laughter and turned round to see the old woman laughing and slapping her knee. She laughed till she wheezed and her eyes filled with tears, all to the horror of Rosie Revere, who thought, oh no, never, not ever again will I try to build something to sputter or spin or build with a lever or switch or a gear, and never will I be a great engineer. She turned round to leave, but then great-great-aunt Rose grabbed hold of young Rosie and pulled her in close and hugged her and kissed her and started to cry. You did it! Hooray! It's the perfect first try. This great flop is over. It's time for the next! Young Rosie was baffled, embarrassed, perplexed. I failed, said dear Rosie. It's just made of trash. Didn't you see it? The cheese copter crashed. Yes, said their great-aunt. It crashed. That is true. But first it did just what it needed to do. Before it crashed, Rosie, before that, it flew. Your brilliant flop was a raging success. Come on, let's get busy and on to the next. She handed a notebook to Rosie Revere, who smiled at her aunt as it all became clear. Life might have failures, but this was not it. The only true failure came if you quit. They worked till the sun sneaked away to its bed. Aunt Rose tied her headscarf round Rosie's head and sent her to sleep with a smile ear to ear to dream the bold dreams of a great engineer. At Blue River Creek, all the kids in grade two build gizmos and gadgets and doohickeys too. With each perfect failure, they all stand and cheer, but none quite as proudly as Rosie Revere. Offertory by Kristen Collins We give to remind ourselves how many gifts we have to offer. We give to remember that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. We give because we believe in music and sacred space. We give 
with the faith that, together, we have enough. Despite his auspicious name, Joseph Priestley was a natural-born heretic. Born in England in 1733, he was raised by a free-thinking elderly aunt who encouraged the boy's interests and cared for him during his long illness during his adolescence. Priestley was a kind of child genius who, having mastered the classic languages at school, taught himself a handful of others, including French, Italian, and German, and Chaldean, Syrian, and Arabic. Privately, he also learned the rudiments of geometry, algebra, and mathematics. His home with his aunt also allowed his curiosity about religion to bloom. She sheltered and hosted dissenting preachers, that is, those who rejected the official 39 Articles of the Church of England. The intolerance of the day made religion and politics necessary bedfellows, and radicalism bordering on treason prevailed in the household. In such a setting, and in spite of a speech disorder, Young Joseph set his heart upon being a nonconformist minister. Now, that's an official designation, nonconforming to the Church of England. Priestley's interests, however, were in humankind in general and not in religion alone. His Deep and abiding faith in God compelled him to discover just how God worked in the world, and Priestley set out to find out for himself. 
He became an amateur scientist, and his, in his own laboratory, in his spare time from ministry and tutoring at the college, he set about a series of experiments in the scientific fad of the day. Electricity. Imagine his delight at being invited into London society at a regular coffee house gathering of other academically inclined men of science and befriending the father of electricity, Benjamin Franklin himself. Inspired by the group and his own experiments, Priestley wrote a textbook called the History and Present State of Electricity, published in 1767, which remained the principal text on electricity for nearly 100 years. It's this book that popularized that story of Ben Franklin flying a kite in a storm to court electricity that is so famous in school lore. Beyond the text as a scientific endeavor, it was unique because he also created a scientific narrative as a story illustrating the general progress of humankind as we discover and harness the forces of nature. Here, Priestley's undaunted Unitarian optimism is at play, and what biographer Stephen Johnson deemed a distinctly modern view of the world. Call it progressive futurism. From electricity, Priestley turned his attention to air. He lived for a time next to a brewery and became curious about what was called fixed air or carbonation. In these first experiments with the nature of air, some presented like magic tricks in the parlor for entertaining guests, Priestley invented soda water, the carbonated beverage still popular today. In further experiments, he watched candles and mice expire under glass domes as the air was depleted, but then discovered that a single green plant under a dome could somehow replenish the air making it breathable again, allowing candles and mice to thrive. Thus, Priestley helped sketch out the first draft of the cycle of life on Earth. Plants convert the energy of light into chemical energy, releasing oxygen into the atmosphere and absorbing carbon dioxide. Animals power themselves through the energy stored in plant tissue and oxygen itself, releasing carbon dioxide as a waste product. And so the cycle goes. For his discoveries about air, Priestley won the prestigious Copley Medal, the Nobel Prize of his day. The presenter exclaimed, from these discoveries, we are assured that no vegetable grows in vain, but that from the oak of the forest to the grass of the field, every individual plant is serviceable to humankind. If not always distinguished by some private virtue, yet making a part of the whole, which cleanses and purifies our atmosphere. In this, the fragrant rose and deadly nightshade cooperate. That worldview of optimistic progress and humanity's empowerment was also found in Priestley's radical politics and religion. Ordained a Presbyterian minister, Priestley in seminary, a keen student of the Bible, discovered, as so many heretics before and since, that the actual Christian scriptures contain no reference to a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He converted then to the doctrine of Unitarianism, uni, meaning God is one. And where God is one and undivided, well, you do the math. It means that Jesus was not divine. So with his friend Theophilus Lindsay, Priestley founded the first official Unitarian denomination church in England, 
in 1774. It was known as a doctrine. There just had not been a church dedicated or named for that doctrine before this time. Now, this was a heretical and dangerous declaration, and it made Priestley a dissenter among dissenters, tantamount to treason. For Priestley, the founding of a Unitarian congregation was a necessary and reasonable progression of human history, just as he saw in his approach to scientific endeavors. He'd say, expose as many ideas as possible to as many minds as possible, and the system will ultimately gravitate toward truth and consensus. He wrote, the only method of attaining to a truly valuable agreement is to promote the most perfect freedom of thinking and acting in order that every point of difference may have an opportunity of being fully canvassed, not doubting, but that truth will prevail and that it then a rational, firm, and truly valuable union will take place. Biographer Stephen Johnson explicates the connection. Just as Priestley had demystified what had conventionally been called the spirit of fermenting liquids, thereby inventing soda water, so would he de demystify the spirit of human existence. These were not metaphors, but elements of a connected system. The materialism that helped him isolate pure air could just as readily be applied to the theological question of the soul. The progressive movement of Enlightenment science stood as the great embodiment of God's work on earth. To Priestley, a much more sensible embodiment of the divine than a man crucified almost 2,000 years before. And that movement had too much force not to wipe away the political and theocratic relics that had been carried over from earlier, less sophisticated ages. Priestley himself was explicit that science would provoke political change as well, and warned the English hierarchy has equal reason to tremble as an air pump or an electrical machine. Priestley was well thought of enough as a scientist to ultimately be able to leave private tutoring and move with his wife and four children to Birmingham, where the Industrial Revolution was taking root and where he befriended Erasmus Darwin, James Watt, and Josiah Wedgwood, who financed his scientific endeavors. Over the 11 years spent at his home called Fair Hill, he published some of the most influential and incendiary tracts of political and theological writing, shaping events and minds in England, America, and France in the 1780s. While some have criticized the randomness of his work and haphazard methodology, his work inspired and spurred on the work of other scientists, including the French chemist Antoine Lavoisier, who created the first periodic table of the elements, Benjamin Franklin, and three U.S. presidents. Among the 500 books and tracts he published included one of the first to systematize English grammar, a volume about education that profoundly influenced Thomas Jefferson's curriculum at the University of Virginia, and many writings on politics, particularly to support the French Revolution, urging government to maximize civil liberty. It was while teaching himself to draw in order to illustrate one of his books that he discovered rubber could remove pencil marks from paper. That's it. Priestley invented the eraser. The beginning of the end of Priestley's fortunes was the publication of a book called History of the Corruptions of Christianity. While Thomas Jefferson would cite the volume as responsible for his faith as he understood it, 
the Orthodox were outraged by his deconstruction of anything he deemed superstition, magical, or mystic. An open assault, not just on the idea of the Trinity and the divinity of Jesus, but also the Eucharist, predestination, atonement, that is, that Jesus died for our sins, the soul, the Last Supper, saints, and angels. All of these ideas he considered corruptions. But for all that, perhaps the most taunting of Priestley's ideas was his assertion that surely the first historical Christians must have all been Unitarians. He sought to show that true Christianity embodied in the beliefs of the primitive church was Unitarian and that all departures from that faith were then corruptions. Priestley would surely have fit in with our modern ideas of Unitarian Universalism, but make no mistake, among the scientists of his day, he was still considered unusual because he was a scientist who believed in God. The book on corruptions in Christianity, coupled with his more political tracts supporting the French Revolution, unleashed a storm of criticism and threats. Rather than retreat or quiet down, Priestley wrote a sermon that would be his final undoing. In this rallying cry of politics and Unitarianism, Priestley wrote, Let us not therefore be discouraged, though for the present we should see no great number of churches professedly Unitarian. It is sufficiently evident that Unitarian principles are gaining ground every day. Priestley goes on to expound how Unitarianism was planting a seed that would yield a full harvest, then on again as a dormant volcano set to erupt into action, and then as an explosive conclusion, he makes an editorial decision that would change his life. In these explosive times of revolution and political unrest, Priestley likens his justification for the Unitarian value of free inquiry, our search for truth and meaning, to war. He wrote, We are, as it were, laying gunpowder, grain by grain, under the old building of error and superstition, which a single spark may hereafter inflame, in consequence of which that edifice, the erection of which has been the work of ages, may be overturned in a moment, and so effectually as that the same foundation can never be built on again. The metaphor itself became a nickname. Joseph Priestley was vilified forever after as Gunpowder Joe. Parodied in newspapers and caricatures, his rallying sermon remarks taken out of context so that the laying of gunpowder was treated as threat and treason. And in 1791, an angry mob fueled by fear, suspicion, and misinformation came to protest a political dinner, and angered when thwarted, responded by storming the new meeting house where Priestley preached, making a bonfire of its pews and books. Then they marched to the old meeting house and set cemetery and church afire. Meanwhile, Joseph Priestley and his family were engaged in a game of backgammon at their home at the edge of town when they were interrupted by a friend who raced in with the news of the riots and the terrifying news that the crowd was on its way there to Fair Hill. The family escaped before the drunken mob arrived, and using materials from his laboratory, the mob burned home, lab, library, experiments, manuscripts, and scientific tools. All burned to the ground. 
Priestley and his family were left to start over, and not daring to return to home, they left town, but not before writing a public letter of protest at the riots and the authorities' reluctance to respond. In the letter, Priestley jabbed at the conservative mob's values, saying, in effect, that if this violence represents your Christian spirit, how dare you recommend your religious principles in preference to our Unitarian ones? Ultimately, marked and hounded for his radical views, the family emigrated to America in 1794. Priestley received a hero's welcome in North America, dined with President George Washington, and upon the recommendation of his good friend, Benjamin Franklin, also befriended John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. In America, Priestley repeated his history, but his style was compromised by the slow males and his isolated country home. Here, there was no company of fellows nearby, no free flow of ideas. In his urban forays, he did found the first congregation in North America to ever call itself Unitarian as a denomination and not just a creedal position in Philadelphia in 1796. And though many were glad to make Priestley's acquaintance, these were volatile times in America, so any close relations with Gunpowder Joe were a liability. He was at once then celebrated, but at a safe distance because of his radical and loud political and theological views. When John Adams, also a Unitarian, became president of the United States, he took pains to distance himself. A by now American tradition of aspiring politicians distancing themselves from their controversial religious advisors during campaign season. Priestley passed away in 1804 after dictating revisions to one last essay. Priestley never gave up. I know this rose will open. I know my fear will burn away. I know my soul will unfurl its wings. I know this rose will open. I know, 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 I know. I
science, faith, and politics. It is at our peril that we deem these separate realms of expertise or even mutually exclusive science, faith, and politics. For Priestley, these form a continuum with new developments in each domain reinforcing and intensifying the others. Seeing the three as convergent paths allows for a progressive understanding of how we as individuals interact with and are responsible within our ever-widening circles of environment, as in community, country, geography, and world. Two legacies from Priestley's expansive work impact our Unitarian Universalist understanding of the world today. First, while Priestley is credited for having laid the foundations for the science of chemistry, his experiments with plants, animal life, and the air we breathe had vaster implications. His insight was the first inkling of the Earth as a vast, interconnected system, and our air and the trees around us were finally seen as a resource that we must protect. In discovering how Mother Nature had invented our atmosphere, Priestley was inventing something just as profound, the ecosystem view of the world. Such an insight could only have come from a convergence of science, faith, and politics, for ecosystem science requires an interconnected web of ideas and expertise that took nearly two centuries to develop from this first germ of an idea. And this new idea of ecosystems, this science, is embedded as a part of our religious faith as modern Unitarian Universalists, as affirmed in our seventh principle, promoting respect for the interdependent web of being of which we are all a part. Science created our faith. Our chase of reason exploded myths and arrested idolatry. Science is embedded in our way of being religious, in our affirmation of the search for truth and meaning, in the interconnected web often described as our nod to neo-paganism, but consider it also our most scientific principle. And it is explicitly drawn in three of our six sources of inspiration, citing as our own articles of faith, our direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder, moving us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life, the guidance of reason and the results of science, and the lessons of earth-centered traditions which instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. These insights of science inform our faith and our understanding of natural science and human nature, informing us as politically active people, poised to use our power to effect change in our communities and in our world at large. Priestley's second legacy also celebrates the web, but a different one, the world wide web of the internet. Priestley's multidisciplinary approach to understanding and his vast web of interpersonal connections, his habit of sharing his hunches at countless coffee halls and pulpits, classrooms, and pamphlets, this communal approach to learning and sharing the free flow of ideas is an idea itself whose time has come again. The privatization of information prevailed throughout the Industrial Revolution when the corporate model of individual profit prevailed. Necessarily, we specialized education and expertise in order to capitalize on the explosion of information. But information, unlike energy, is not a finite commodity. Its free flow makes it more useful, not limited. And the next flood of understanding and insights are not likely to come from a lone inventor in a garage, but a collective of people sharing information. Our most modern scientific models, problems, and trends require a multidisciplinary approach. 
global warming, neuroscience, genomic revolution, information theory, ecosystem science, vaccine creation, and computer science in the age of social media. We are standing at the cusp of another such revolution of mind, what one of my colleagues calls divining the digital reformation. And just as in Priestley's time, the hint of how plants regenerate breathable air revealed the ecosystem of the planet, how scientific discovery undermined and therefore liberalized religious belief, how discoveries in sociology, transportation, and communication revolutionized government, so progress and the revelations of this pandemic era will necessitate change in the coming decades. That's the irony of it all, that progress inevitably undermines the institutions and belief systems of the past. Embracing change meant embracing the possibility that everything would have to be reinvented. Like gunpowder laid at the foundations. Priestley never systematized his discoveries, never patented a single invention, and never held a political office. But Gunpowder Joe's contribution to the world was his ability to explode prevailing paradigms, challenging old conventions, and establishing a revolution of the mind. Joseph Priestley was, as John Adams wrote, a great, excellent, an extraordinary man, really a phenomenon, a comet in the system. May we be so. My blood doth rise in the roots of yon oak, and the sap doth run in my today is from our hymnals, uh, song number 343, A Fire Mist and a Planet. This is a poem by William Herbert Carruth. A fire mist and a planet, 
a crystal and a cell, a starfish and a saurian, and caves where ancients dwell. The sense of law and beauty, a face turned from the sod. Some call it evolution, and others call it God. Haze on the far horizon, the infinite tender sky, the ripe rich tents of cornfields and wild geese sailing high, and over high and lowland the charm of goldenrod. Some people call it autumn, and others call it God. Like tides on crescent sea beach, when moons so new and thin, into our hearts high yearnings come welling, surging in. Come from the mystic ocean whose rim no foot has trod. Some people call it longing, and others call it God. A sentry, lone and frozen, a mother for her brood, and Socrates' dread hemlock, and Jesus on the rood, and millions who, though nameless, the straight, hard pathway trod. Some call it consecration, and others. Call it God. Spirit of life, come unto me, sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion, blow in the wind, rise in the sea. Giving life the shape of justice, bruise hold me close, swing set me free, spirit of life, come to me, come.
Romans 12 in the Christian scriptures says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. May it be so, friends. Let us carry the flame and let the people say, Amen. Fire the water, return, 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 return. I, 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 I,